Okay. So um, my name is Simmons Bunton. I'm the editor in chief of terrain.org and I'm coming to you from Tucson, Arizona where I respectfully acknowledge my presence on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Odom and the Pascua Yaqui. I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I especially wanna thank our readers, Joy Castro, Elizabeth Jacobson and Alan Braden and you, of course, the audience, and then Juan Morales, who is going to be really taking the show uh, to a much higher level after I stop talking here in just a few minutes. Um, so uh, some administrative, I suppose, if your connection becomes slow, you may want to turn off your video. In all cases, I ask that you remain muted, at least until the Q&A at the end, uh, but you're welcome to post your questions and other po positive feedback in the chat. Um, and again, we'll probably open it up to audio questions uh, after the reading too. But yeah, post your questions as you have them in the chat. Uh, we are recording this and all of our readings. We'll make those available from train.org um, and on our YouTube channel uh, a week or so after the reading. Although I have to admit, I totally blanked on the last reading. So I'll be adding that one here really soon as well. But we do eventually get to them all, I promise. Um, and while you're on YouTube checking that out, um, we'd love if you would officially follow the, the YouTube channel. I promise we won't spam you via that, but as soon as we can get up to 100 subscribers, then we can change it to a much more reasonable URL that people can remember. Um, oh, let's let in somebody for the waiting room. No, gone. Okay. Our series is held on the fourth Monday of every month, as I think you may know, um, on October 25th. We will host readings and Q&A by the amazing fiction writers Pam Houston, English Brooks, and Ramona Emerson. The links to register for that reading will be found on train.org shortly, not there just yet, and we'll put it on Facebook as well from an event page. So look for those soon. So while folks are talking and reading and doing other great stuff that you're here for, I'll be posting book links in the chat in support of our readers this evening from their books, as well as links over to train.org content. But if you miss those book links or want to find other books by tonight's readers and other terrain.org contributors, pop on over to our bookshop page at bookshop.org slash terrain.org or find the link under the about uh, menu item on the terrain.org website. So now, if I may, a few words about terrain.org. We are the world's first online environmental journal publishing since 1998 which also makes us, uh, as I've heard anyway, the second longest publishing online literary journal still out there, right behind Brevity, in case you're wondering what number one is. We are an all volunteer organization that doesn't charge to access our content, nor charge to submit, with the exception of uh, our contests, uh, nor contain advertising. Indeed, we are run by the power of goodwill and dedicated weekends and evenings. And we are run, just so I can put this out there, by donations from good folks like you who are welcome to donate to terrain.org online at terrain.org slash donate. Thank you for your support and for being a part of the terrain.org community. All right, so now let's turn to the reading, which again will be followed by a Q&A. Please post your questions in the chat area, although we'll have a chance to ask those uh, after the reading as well. And thanks again for joining us. So now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's host, Juan Morales. Juan J. Morales is the son of an Ecuadorian mother and Puerto Rican father. He is the author of three poetry collections, including The Handyman's Guide to End Times, winner of the 2019 International Latino Book Award, Recent poems have appeared in Crazy Horse, The Laurel Review, Break Beats Volume 4, Latinx, Ascentos Review, Collateral, Terrain.org, Salamander, Pink, and Poetry. He is a Catamundo Fellow, a Macondo Fellow, the editor publisher of Pilgrimage Press, and professor of English and the Associate Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at Colorado State University Pueblo. Ah, but hold on. Though I knew his poetry and editing of Pilgrimage, I first met Juan one October up at Southern Utah University several years ago for the inaugural Eco Poetry Conference that uh, Danielle Dubraski leads there. Before that, however, I must admit I had a different expectation of Juan. 
you know, you read so much about someone as accomplished as Juan, and you think, well, this fellow must really be up there in age a bit. Turns out that Juan was a fair bit younger than I expected, and certainly a lot younger than me, as more and more people are, I suppose. And so prodigy might not be quite the right word, but how about marvel? Yeah. So Juan, you young marvel, you take it away. Wow. Wow. Um... Simmons, you 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 were too kind with your 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 kind introduction, and um, uh, no, it's an honor and pleasure to collaborate with you and, and the rest of the fam uh, with Terrain.org. It's uh, um, they've published so many so many wonderful, important, groundbreaking works in, in, in all genres, and I'm honored to have a few works or uh, poems fe- featured over the years, and so. Um, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I want to do a land acknowledgement for myself here in Pueblo, Colorado, and then I'm gonna read the bios and just keep us going because I, I know you all want to get to the to the amazing heavyweight writers that we're gonna get to this evening. So, um, and it's so wonderful to see 50 people on a Zoom poetry reading on a Monday night. That that's 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 wonderful. You all should could, you know applaud yourself for for supporting the poetry community. You know because. Um, I know, I know a lot. I know a lot of people around here think the pandemic's over, but it's not. Um, so I hope you're staying safe and, and making good choices for everyone to stay safe as well. And this is a great way to kind of practice a little literary citizenship while you're while you're staying safe. Um, so uh, here in Pueblo, we stand on Ute, Cheyenne, Hikari, Apache, and ancestral Puebloan lands. And I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, uh, including the Numananu. Comanche and Kiowa to the east, the Pueblos and the Humanos to the south, and the Arapaho to the north, and just full acknowledgement of all the ancestors in our own lives, in our literary lives, and otherwise that kind of help help us uh, help us get us where we're going. So, um, yeah. So we have three phenomenal readers, and I'm going to I'm going to just cut the banter and get to the first one, and I will do my best to gush and and show my admiration to these three readers. Um, yeah. So our first reader tonight is Alan Braden. Alan Braden, excuse me. And he lives in Lakewood, Washington and has served as an assistant poetry editor of terrain.org from 2015 to 2021. So Alan is strong terrain.org fam, as you can see. He is the author of A Reef of Down and Drops of Blood an Elegy in the Passive Voice. Originally from White Swan, Washington, Alan has received fellowships from the NEA and Artist Trust, as well as residencies at Playa, Centrum, the Poetry Center, and the School of Art Institute of Chicago. And he has he has th- um, several features that will probably be linked in the chat, so keep your eyes out for it. And includes uh, one, of, one of the f- beautiful poems from the Letter to America series, and then another one with three poems. So without further ado, my friends, please join me in welcoming Adam, Alan Braden. So it's great to be on Zoom with Joy and Elizabeth. And thank you, Juan, for being kind enough to host us. You're doing a marvelous job so far. Um, so 2021 was my last year, actually the spring of 2021. It's my last time with the Terrain Bunch and I already missed the interactions. Um, and the conferences and even just the back and forth, the the emailing, especially with Annie and Derek and Simmons. Um, I apologize for the lighting. It's only, I've only been experimenting for a year and a half and I haven't quite figured it out. I try to use natural lighting, but we're in the Pacific Northwest, so it's raining right now. So I'm using more artificial. Um, I have seven poems that I'd like to read tonight, starting with one that's set in the woods outside of a tiny little town called Bickleton, Washington. And the poem is called Inspiration. Not far from where a coyote led me over the sparsely timbered hillside, I found a feather held in sagebrush, flanking an abandoned logging road. 
I knew the pattern. It's bars of tan, almost the color of parchment, or that coyote's pelt, actually. The feather of a great horned owl. You could say the darker, narrower scribbles curving toward the quill suggest rows of silhouettes in flight. You could say a lesson might exist in the wind's subtle dispersal of dust trickling through sheep skull gap, estranging that feather from its wing. All you really need to tell anyone is how a single feather was poised so the tip of the quill wrote on thin air. After my great grandfather immigrated from Sweden, he worked at the sawmill on the Tacoma waterfront. So this poem is called Postscript from the Old Town Exchange. Concrete outnumbers clear cuts. The Union Pacific shrills by hustling pulp and lumber 24 seven. Holidays too. Coupling, uncoupling, such racket composing the score of industry scoring the switchyard quiet. Sawmill men know the key to unlocking green timber, that ping within a pang when tempered stone, steel hones true, each measure hoboing so poorly, westerning west just to stretch a dime. Each one pockets a silver tune. What abundance, what abundance to get here. What rich music abandon. <clears throat> this poem starts with a line from a middle, not middle-aged, a Welsh poet of the Middle Ages. It's called Postscript with a line from Davith Op Gwilym. Until honey comes from stones instead of steam from wet cobbles between downpours in old town, our lives unravel on their own. Yes, even the innocent revel in trouble. Seamus, for one, with his fire engine bashing the squad car until nap time. Dreams of sirens, flames, unlikely rescue. Though Cammy breaks apart the entwined bulbs, and then folds in one after another where you rototilled and mulched. Though bumblebees on lavender fumble at pebbles of pollen to dream up nectar, just imagine that golden stash in hive dark somewhere out west where light blossoms into cascades of honey. Maybe, as we've been taught, the power to create does outshine the succulent power to destroy. Which would you say rules body, rules spirit? This is called Postscript. Coastal Note Inland. The unshaven have a place here too. Siren's bar lures a drunk inside only to cut him off. Salt air sobers the rest of us to sip or use a straw. Off Quincy dock, jellyfish schooling as if the port's planned parenthood dumped all its discontinued sponges 
all its expired condoms into the sea. Innocence cartwheeling on the beach. Are you alone reading this? The tide rolls pasta out of kelp along Dungeness spit. A doe and her spotty twins orbit my cabin twice a day, all right out of some brochure. Reminders I belong somewhere. A place in the new west is as good as anywhere, I guess. Are the cots still on the trees there? Market steady to a nickel higher. Cash comes ashore in a ship's hold. No chance of rainfall today. Tomorrow looks doubtful too. This poem is called RSVP. And it starts with a epigraph, like the taste of honey on a sharpened razor blade by John Wood. Cumulus, nimbus, cirrus, altostratus, words reversed, right side down, emboss an invitation across the blue. A bumblebee loud meadow with its jasmine tremble of breeze beckons. Your new life in the new west is burgeoning. You're not the only one thinking about change, how sugary syrup can turn. Look, cedar, then timber, then fire. Blossom equals pollen equals nectar. Meantime, contrails revise your dearest lines into white, a beekeeper leaving enough only for the survival of the hive. Like a lover someday lying on a checkered blanket, this new life kicks back, cracks open a long neck, toasts the clouds waiting. Sweetness isn't a whisper in your ear or the moment after, but the naming of desire. This is called Poem on July 4th. Once we hit orchard country, the signs grow taller than ladders. Fruit, wood, feed, camp, Migrants squat in the grange, the elks, the lions, long extinct. Then the lumberyard shut down. Halfway flat campground delivers as promised. We ache and creak in the morning, piss the fire out after breakfast, drive east again. I tell Boone how firefighters who'd promised to save ours cabin, joked and let it burn. He says his dad used to skid lodgepole pine near there. We pass Buena's hop kiln, born again as winery. Piety flats misnamed by developers. Burial grounds move twice for an on-ramp. Next, waves of Pilsner wheat parched as tinder. To remember freedom tonight, we set the sky on fire. So a lot of things in the last two years have been pretty strange, but I thought um, in these parts, last spring was especially surreal when the schools reopened. So this is called Postscript Post-COVID. The school buses on route again, veering left for the hypotenuse of Angle Road. In school clothes a year outgrown, 
kids jostle and jockey into forgotten order. Parents cuss the school zones like it's the end of summer. It just doesn't feel like fall with its tang of Elmer's paste, pencil shavings, borax, cut grass, and enough construction paper to engineer a rainbow. Why are trillium conjugating in our yards? Some answers may vary, like memory with its waft of harvest time, hops, grapes, spear and peppermints punctuating the atmosphere of back to school mornings. Lateral A, B and C bisect the bankrupt fields from here to Main Street. You stepped into the same bus for 12 years. Do the math. You earned finally a ticket out of that split infinitive of a town for a future nothing but glam. Fall never smelled like freedom until now. Thanks everybody. All right. Thank you so much, Alan. So many, so many beautiful images and, and, and just like such a, such a vivid use of the landscape. Um, some of my favorite moments included like the, the, you know, the, the beautiful skies and, and, and the one kind of describing honey in that, in that juxtaposition with like the, the West. Thank you so much. Um, and remember friends, if you do have questions for Alan and our other talented, beautiful writers, um, you can put them in the chat or if you wanna hold them, you maybe put it, maybe put it on your phone notes or something like that so you don't forget because we're gonna have that, I know we're gonna have that awkward moment afterwards where we're all gonna kind of just sit there and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna sit there and look at you back and say, check your phone, check your notes uh, for those wonderful questions for Alan and, and our other writers. So um, speaking of other writers, uh, we have our next reader and that would be Elizabeth Jacobson. Elizabeth Jacobson was the fifth poet laureate of Santa Fe, New Mexico and an Academy of American Poets 2020 laureate fellow. Her most recent book, Not Into the Blossoms and Not Into the Air, won the new Measure Poetry Prize selected by Marion Borish, Free Verse Editions Parlor Press 2019 and the 2019 New Mexico Arizona Book Award for both New Mexico Poetry and Best New Mexico Book. Her other books include Her Knees Pulled In by Tres Chicas Books in 2012 and two chat books from Dancing Girl Press, Are the Children Make Believe? Question mark, 2017 and A Brown Stone 2015. She's the founding director of the Wingspan Poetry Project, a not-for-profit which for, from 2013 to 2020 conducted weekly poetry classes in battered family and homeless shelters in New Mexico. Wingspan received four grants from the Witter Biner Foundation for Poetry. She's also, I don't know how you have time to do all this, but she is also co-founding director of Poetry Pollinators, an eco-poetry public art initiative supporting native solitary bees. Poetry Pollinators is, is the recipient of grants from the Whitner Biner Foundation in the Poetry and New Mexico Arts. Elizabeth is finally also the review editor for the online literary journal terrain.org. So she's part of the terrain.org fam as well. And when she's not doing all these amazing, wonderful things and publishing all these beautiful books, she teaches poetry workshops regularly in the Santa Fe community. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Jacobson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. Can you, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure you can hear me, yeah. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Simmons. And uh, Alan, that was a gorgeous reading. I enjoyed it so much, so thank you. Um, I, um, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I've lived here for um, over 32 years, uh, but I do spend uh, the last few years, we've spent some time in Miami Beach, which is uh, quite different, uh, obviously. And um, I'm gonna read this first poem that uh, I wrote there. It's called, I always know where to put my hands on a tree. I am outside at the plastic wicker table under the cocoa palm, whose golf ball sized seeds keep dropping on my paper, leaving wet brown spots from the sooty tropical mist, trying to write a poem with the first line, 
I always know where to put my hands on a tree. When a car goes by, mattress on the roof, two guys in the front seats, each one with an arm out his window, one hand on each side is all that's holding a mattress down as they rush along with everyone else on the busy street. A German shepherd that lives on the block sees a stray cat preening itself across the road, yanks himself free from his person, dashes in front of the car, which jerks to a halt, mattress shooting off like a cannonball, flattening the biker who is crossing the road and texting at the same time. I always know where to put my hands on a tree, tip of a branch in my mouth, flesh of its fruit on my lips. The hog plums have fallen on the sand in the shadow of their own canopy. Today is everyone's lucky day. The biker is young and sturdy. Her bike remains undamaged. The men jump out of the car, yelling at the dog in Italian, calling to the girl, Bella, Bella, as she speeds away, stuffing her phone in her back pocket. They chase after the dog, and when they catch it, bring him back to his person, who pretends to smack him on the muzzle with the leash. I always know where to put my hands on a tree. This one here, tamarind pods open and sticky, their pace not sweet, but bursting with sugar just the same. I had been thinking of ending my poem by trying to explain the smell that comes off the sea as the sun is rising over it first thing in the morning, how this heats the water, which creates a fragrant salty vapor which mixes with the air, and that when I open my kitchen window while brewing my coffee, intoxicates me so, I get this tantalizing feeling of being this moment in the exact right place. I always know where to put my hands on myself, like this, sun rising, salt air warming, the sea inside me, the tragedy of the living. Um, I, I, I forgot to mention that I'm reading uh, just two poems from my most recent collection, Not Into the Blossoms and Not Into the Air. And um, then I'm gonna read some new poems and um, I'm just gonna read six poems tonight. This poem is called um, Blood Moon and uh, it remembers Matthew Shepard, a young man who was murdered in Wyoming in 1998. Blood Moon, echoes of a hate crime. People are made of paper, love affairs, anything that tears easily. A pregnant woman stands under the lunar eclipse, carves a swirl into a tree. Her baby is born with this same mark on his thigh. It's just like the earth to come between the sun and the moon and cause this kind of mystery. Point at a rainbow and it will plummet and slice your finger off. Use your lips instead to show others what you are looking at. Don't stand on high rocks or they will push you into the sky and you will be pressed like a flower in a book. People are made from rain showers, hatred, smears of spit, anything that might evaporate instantly. That night, the moon was a true blood red, not the pale rust of this moon this morning an entire human body coated red with blood, except where a path of tears wash through. Don't stare at the moon or it will follow you persistently like a stray cat you have fed. Don't hold out your hands when the sun is shining or you will burn continually with possibility. People are made of buckets of sand, sequins of clay, desire, anything that washes away easily. Don't inhale too deeply the scent of fallen leaves pasted to the forest floor after a fresh rain, or you will be repeatedly stepped on. Don't count the seeds in a mound of bear scat, or just as many clouds will split open above your head. So uh, this next poem, um, you might find it humorous, uh, I do. It's called The Story of Her Arrival. It has to be one of the gloomiest human characteristics to wish for something from the past to return again, 
So when my girl calls and says she wants her first room back, the one that gurgled and swayed, suspending her in that gravity-free chamber of my body, I say, deal with it, baby. I'm out in the garden with the bees from the honey hive, drones who are male, inseminate the queen, then drop dead. A queen who stores the sperm for her lifetime, the workers who are all female. These bees don't mate like other insects, not like the grasshoppers on the stucco wall the other morning, the big on top of the small, legs wrapping and unwrapping around thoraxes, body shaking, not shaking, then shaking again. These creatures were at it for hours. Believe me, I kept going to check. So when my girl says she wants back in, I tell her to go get laid. Mom, she cries, her big brown heart of a face on the FaceTime, a mysterious blend of Ashkenazi and Sephardic, her black eyes stone fruit, the endless night sky of her dark hair, all that making of her days into evenings, my legs wrapping and unwrapping, then over my head propped on a wall. It's her 24th birthday and she wants the story of her arrival, the cave I hiked to the afternoon before, the mucus pug the following morning, the salmon I baked in the toaster oven when contractions were five minutes apart, believing it would strengthen me during labor when all it did was cause me to burp salmon for 10 hours. Honey, I asked, can we talk later? I need to get back to the garden. The bumblebees are sonicating in the sunflowers, vibrating like crazy. Their pollen baskets are brimming. As long as there is desire, honey, you will suffer. But without it, you flatline, and I hang up. So weird reading on Zoom. I, I still haven't really completely gotten the knack of it. This next poem is called Canyon Road. Driving on black ice, I braked too hard spun into a 360, and then two more. Like a boom of a sailboat, the back of the car, the car slammed a dog. In the midnight darkness, I got out to find a coyote, his abdomen torn open. The canine held my gaze as I cradled his head, one palm above his brow, the other on his snout and hugged him to my thigh until the chasm of his breath closed. An alone, excuse me, an aloneness, not loneliness, came from the animal. Yellow flecks inside his eyes flashed for an instant before they turned to ice. I tucked the coyote's cooling body under pine brush, covered it with snow. Nothing is made less by dying. Walking the next morning, in the early fog, I watched a Cooper's hawk fly up and up above the road to scan the world for prey, then spiral down effortlessly as if it were a single feather, hollow shaft traveling toward the white frost. So two more, this is called the type of fool I am. When you are by the sea on an island made mostly of cement, when in the morning there are no morning doves susurrating in the strangler fig, no grackles settling down in palm crowns at nightfall, when a brown anole fans its dewlap defending its territory of pavers and another crawls out from under a pile of fallen Brazilian beauty leaf branches, a greasy black tail spout, uh, sorry, a greasy black tail sprout growing from its broken stub. Where the mangrove forest is no longer a forest, no longer an oyster grove, your raft no longer banked in its dense cabled roots. When a cormorant drives for young snook in the bay, then wobbles on a rusty culvert to spread and dry its enormous wings. Because some days you feel the incremental acceleration in each moment, which cannot be described by language 
and embeds in the mind like a speck of grit. Because on those days, you were like a tongue cut from a mouth. Because on those days, when you are still not empty enough, you lie on the hot brick patio and sweat. Your self-absorption is flawless. Your limbs soften into the sinking mortar. You stare and stare at the blistering sky. Then finally, having reached the very bottom, like a trap that has sprung, you feel a slight coil of return, a slight lifting up, as if the mind could cure one failure of the self after another. And uh, this is the last poem I'm going to read. It's called, There Are As Many Songs in the World as Branches of Coral. I walk a long way, sinking in soft sand. My feet, two creatures of burden, low-lying clouds, mirror stormy ocean waves, and wild eddies. The rack line littered with elkhorn, with coral sponges, each one a finger from a different hand. Disappeared are the reefs they arose from. As a child, I comb black rocks of a jetty, prying starfish from pools, sucked salt off their legs, curious podia searching my tongue. I craved also the taste of ash, ate cigarette butts from the beach, put anything in my mouth to know it. I was nine when I first saw the photographs, bodies overflowing from wheelbarrows, corpses pitched in heaps like firewood at the sides of barracks. Didn't recognize what they were. Then I noticed the bird, a raven, eating the inside of a human nose. There are as many songs in the world as branches of coral. The sponges, the sea pens, the whips have a bloody earthy smell. I lay the few I've collected on the wicker table to dry under the adenidia palms and squeeze out the remaining brine. Soon they begin to sigh. These hours when the sky is white, my heart reels like a key in a squall and I arrive again at the scowl of the red brick gate. There were no clouds that day above the camp. The grassy fields, bright green, tall birches in full leaf. I walked weightlessly on the train tracks, one foot in front of the other, balancing on rails. I pulled a rusty hairpin from the soil, put it in my mouth, 75-year-old tarnish, a perfumed female essence, the remaining brick, chimneys crumbling, splintered garrisons, burial pits moaned. Here was an endless landscape of hatred this primeval. It was as if I saw each soul who had arrived and departed shimmering impossibly in the emerald fields and everything broke open and sang. There were no clouds that day I visited Birkenau, but the sky, it was white. The meadows, they glistened. The tall birches beckoned. Before I left, I ate a few blades of grass, peeled off a strip of bark, pressed two sharp stones into my well-made shoe. Thank you so much, everyone. And again, thank you, Alan, and I'm so looking forward to Joy's reading. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Wow, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And um, I, I respectfully disagree with you about your, I don't know about reading on Zoom statement. I think a lot of people also disagree. So I hope you give it to us this time. Um, but no, thank you so much for the wonderful poems. Um, and yeah, I, I, I look forward to the Q&A, maybe hearing some more about the process of how Santa Fe has kind of shaped your writing as well. So um, yeah, damn, we're, we're having a good night, aren't we? So far, so good, everyone. 
Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, yeah, just, just once again, um, uh, take a look at the chats because uh, Simmons is, is copying and pasting and typing and, and putting all kinds of great ways that you can kind of think about supporting these, po these poets and writers, you know, because, um, you know, with these readings, it's, it's, it's not, it, we're not, we don't have the luxury of having that opportunity to go up afterwards and buy the book. So maybe, maybe, if, maybe, maybe I uh, click the link, order it or, or hit up your local bookstore or, you know, bookshop.org or whatever you got to do to kind of support these, you know, support your fellow writers as well. So, um, and as always, I think uh, terrain.org has a great link where you can kind of find more information on, on our readers and other terrain.org fam. So, so please do so. And um, uh, that brings us to our final final reader for the evening. And then we'll have a spirited Q&A discussion kind of portion of the program. Um, Joy Castro. And um, yes, so I'm going to read the bio and go from there. Joy Castro is the author of the post-Katrina New Orleans literary thrillers, Hell or High Water, which received the Nebraska Book Award and Nearer Home. And on a personal note, I'm hoping that it's a trilogy. I've been kind of dying and waiting to see what happens next. Um, but I'll have to kind of consult these other books in the meantime while I wait for that question. Um, and the short in the story collection, How Winter Began, as well as the memoir, The Truth Book, and the essay collection, Island of Bones, which received the International Latino Book Award. She's also the editor of the anthology Family Trouble and served as the guest judge of Craft First Creative Nonfiction Award. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Sense of Cinema, Salon, Plowshares, Gulf Coast, Brevity, Afro-Hispanic Review, and elsewhere. A former writer in residence at Vanderbilt University, she is currently the Willa Cather Professor of English and Ethnic Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Her novel, brand new novel, it's so, it's so new, it's still hot, very hot, and there's a big poster of it behind her. So if you were kind of curious what the cover looks like, take a peek. Uh, Flight Risk, which examines our fertility choices and resistance to fossil fuel industries in a time of climate catastrophe. Is it forthcoming in November still? So we're still not there yet, huh? Wait. All right, we're almost there. Okay. Um, and also Simmons will be posting a Letters to America from Joy uh, at some point in the chat. So without further ado, our last reader of the evening, uh, join me in welcoming Joy Castro. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, am I audible? Okay, fantastic. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. This is a real honor. So um, as Juan mentioned, uh, I have a novel forthcoming, and I'm going to read you the beginning of it. Pregnancy makes you tired, they say. It's the effort of making all those new cells, I suppose, those tiny translucent organs that consumes your energy at a bone deep level. Every moment seems like a good time for a nap. Sofas beckon. I've seen other women's sonograms, the small twin lungs, the dark heart beating. At night, I close my eyes and see them, those hummingbird hearts. A few breaths later, I'm dreaming open grassland, oceans softly rocking. Nothing we can manufacture with our hands or our brains is so delicate and intricate, yet it all unfolds without our thought or will. Week seven, a beating heart. Week nine, nipples, elbows. Week 22, eyelashes. Your body doing all that, whether you want it to or not. They say exhaustion hovers just above you like a blanket, ready to drop, ready to smother all those things you thought were so important, your career, your household chores, your circle of friends, the yoga class that seemed so crucial at the time. Everything melts away. You're an incubator, nothing but. Your body a traitor to all your old causes. Equal pay for equal work, environmental justice, safety on the streets, very nice but all you really crave is sleep. Endless, luxuriant bouts of afternoon sleep stretched out on the bed in a long rhombus of warm sun. You arrange your limbs for comfort. Slumber closes down over you like a drug. You dream of a baby gazing up from your arms, curls shining, 
eyes radiant with love. Then you wake, gasping for breath. The list. The legacy for my mother is 17 things. One, a small white house in the hills of West Virginia. The paint fading even in my childhood surely curls back now, peeling away in long crumbling strips, exposing bare wood to the elements. Home, the nest, the scene of the crime. No one lives there now except the wild things. Two, a craving for nicotine. I chew gum, fiddle with paper clips, gnaw the ends of yellow pencils. Three, a thirst for hard liquor. Four, a taste for rough men. Hers were bikers and truckers. Mine were attorneys, surgeons, sons of wealthy families, boxers, men who owned boats all self-declared masters of their various universes. They seemed powerful, bold, magnetic. Control is sexy until it's not. Married now two years to John, a Darcy, a Knightley, a truly good man. I like to think I have outgrown this particular inheritance. Five, a hunger to run. Six, a taste for cheap food. Hamburger helper, Kool-Aid, Oscar Mayer, uniform slices of pink rubbery bologna, red rimmed, smeared with mayonnaise, squashed between spongy white slices of bread, tuna casserole made with cream of mushroom soup and gray canned peas with potato chips crumbled on top, Heinz ketchup squeezed onto Kraft mac macaroni and cheese and stirred with a fork until orange. In John's circle, such things aren't eaten, their punchlines, the stuff of a gas remarks. I cook them alone in the kitchen at night after he's fallen asleep and eat standing up at the counter, staring out over the black lake. Seven, a suspicion of the state and its services, social workers, police, anyone who wants to help us. Eight, silence. What you don't say can't haunt you. Plead the fifth. Nine, a love of dark licorice, sweet like danger. In my childhood, it was an exotic treat, rare and expensive, a delicacy, a thing that miraculously appeared at Christmas and birthdays or in the pockets of the men my mother saw. I'm told the taste for licorice is hereditary. You like it or you don't. 10, my long boned capable hands. They can change a tire, build a table, twist stuck lids off jars, break a limb. 11, a belief in ghosts. 12, a jumpy metabolism, skittish. My friends here in Chicago often ask what diet I'm on or more quietly, which pill I take and where can they get some? 13, a fear of incarceration, whether by reason of insanity or crime. 14, a love of fairy tales. She used to read them to me at bedtime. I would touch the illustrations with my finger while her scratchy voice unspooled the tale. 15, a fear of children, their messes, their perpetual demands, their softness, the terrible fragility of their bodies. 16, a tiredness bedded down deep in my bones. Even before I was old enough to drink, I woke in the mornings exhausted, worn, and bleak, thinking, another day, an old woman inside a young girl. And in my mother's eyes, that same look. Seventeen, grief, like an ocean, like madness. The dinner party. I'd said I would buy the flowers myself, but that's not how it worked out. The two phone calls waylaid me. After cooking all day and making the whole apartment immaculate, napkins ironed, wine glasses polished, I had only half an hour left to shower and dress for dinner, so I called John and asked him to stop by the florist on his way home. I didn't mention that I'd gotten a call from the prison warden back in West Virginia, a state I hadn't seen since I boarded a Greyhound at 22. I didn't say my knees had buckled when I learned my mother had died in her cell, that I'd clutched the back of a sofa to stay upright. 
I didn't mention Aunt Della. I just asked him to buy the flowers for me. In the shower, I stood with my eyes closed and my hand on the gray Italian marble, hot water streaming down, replaying again in my mind the second phone call. I'd been standing in my studio, still numb from the warden's news, staring blankly at Lake Michigan. When my cell phone rang, I didn't recognize the number, but the area code was 304. There was no hello. You heard about your mama then. Aunt Della's voice, warm as weed killer. I sank into the rocking chair. We hadn't spoken in 20 years. Yes, I said. You coming home for the funeral? Home. I looked down at my lap where my hand twitched like a separate animal. You don't got to, Belle. We'll get her in the ground. We got our preacher coming to do the service. It's the decent thing. Decent, I repeated. We got it all took care of, she said. You don't got to worry. Thank you. A sense of relief stole through me. Then guilt. It's really kind of you. It ain't kind, girl. It's family. A long silence hung over us. You going to stay up there where you're at? I, I don't know yet. You don't know? I saw her hand fly to her ample hip as I'd seen it do so many times in childhood. Well, you ain't got much time to figure it out the sour music of her voice, funerals in five days. Five, I thought of planes, renting a car, trying to explain it all to John. Just stay up there in your big city. We're getting it all took care of. You don't gotta lift a finger. I just don't know yet, I said, I'm not sure. Well, you need to get sure, she said, you need to. Abruptly, I pulled the phone away from my face. I hung up and turned the ringer off. Her number flashed again and again. I was still damp, dressed in only a black lace bra and half slip, my toweled hair, a pile of dark ringlets. When John arrived with his arms full of white peonies and cabbage roses, soft white curling petals on the verge of the blush, fodder for still lifes by Dutch masters. Oh, darling, I threw my arms around his neck. They're perfect. But instead of laughing and tossing the flowers aside and kissing me in the old way, John drew back, stiff, and held out the bouquets. I took them, trying not to deflate as he glanced around, his expression flat. On the long mahogany table, our silver gleamed. The wedding china shone. The whole condo was sluiced with aromas on which I'd worked all day. Slow roasted pork with lime and garlic, saffron rice, black beans with bay leaves. Creamy flan had been setting all night in the fridge. When the guests arrived, I would fry up the boyos and sweet gold maduros, Magda's recipes. John's gaze flicked over me. In his eyes, something warmed, and I felt shy and hopeful standing there in lingerie. He turned away. You'd better do something with your hair, he said, his tone neutral, objective, the tone he'd used to pronounce a verdict on an ultrasound image or inferior wine. He left to go change. I carried the armful of flowers to the kitchen. Over the sink, I clipped the green stems with a quick angle to efficiency. In the various porcelain pictures I'd collected over the two years we'd been married, Warstrand, Wedgwood, Rosenthal, I bunched the blossoms into low, fat arrangements. But in my hand, the scissors shook. Thank you. Wow. There you have it, friends. The first part of Flight Risk, which is available for pre-order. And it looks like according to the link, it shifts ships on November 1st. So um, yeah, I can't wait to can't wait to read that one. So thank you so much, Joy. Um, well, friends, uh, this is the this is the portion of the program where we shift from a from being attentive listeners to our readers and and we start to discuss and converse and and such. Um, yeah, I, I love all the I love all the feedback that you're giving our our readers uh, on there on the, on the chat. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna do the awkward pause thing and see if anyone has any questions, um, and it can be directed to a a specific author or if you have a question that 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 reaches to all three of them, you can ask that 
And okay, I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions. And gushing is acceptable as well, friends. So I'm gonna pick on someone. Someone sent me a, a question on the private chat. So uh, Leanna, are you, are you still here? And uh, do you have your question? Yeah, I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I had a question for Elizabeth. Um, I heard you mention that you have been in Santa Fe for 30 plus years. But my question was, when you did come to this place named after the holy, I'm curious how that influenced your writing. Um, Cause I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with landscape and place. Um, so I wondered if your writing evolved from the landscape or if it stayed the same, just wondered. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's such an interesting question. And um, it's something I actually think about um, kind of a lot because uh, I, I'm originally from New York and uh, I moved here, I was pretty young. So I hadn't written that much um, prior to living in Santa Fe. And I lived in uh, an area really remote uh, for many years on, um, uh, on land in the middle of nowhere um, in, in a, near a town called Cerrillos. And the landscape was really different from where I live now. It was more like um, deserty and now I'm more high mountain um, desert area. So um, I, uh, my work was uh, so infiltrated with the uh, landscape and the creatures from that area um, all the, uh, the flora and, uh, you know, the, the trees and everything. And then when I moved into town, so I, we were about 25 miles out of Santa Fe, uh, and, and I lived there for 15 years, um, it all changed. And at first I was a little stymied, uh, but then I got into it and, uh, you know, the creatures changed. And um, uh, so, I, I mean, I spent a lot of time outside, so it, it totally um, uh, affects my work. In fact, I think that um, most of my work comes from being outside and from what I see. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, gracias. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that wonderful question. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of bully the conversation a little bit because I wanna hear from Joy and Alan regarding landscape because I, I, think, um, I think we can all kind of agree looking at your bios, but also the, the, the work showcased this evening um, kind of talked about that. Uh, Joy, can we start with you and then move to Alan regarding landscape and how it affects your work? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, part of the reason I wrote the novel was just because I wanted to write about the forests, which is where I grew up. Um, so it's, it's really kind of um, an environmentalist screed against big coal um, disguised as a thriller. Um, and uh, a lot of it was just uh, the opportunity to write about running wild in the forests and seeing the land around uh, us get destroyed um, by mining. Um, so yes, very, very influenced by landscape. Um, I haven't lived in West Virginia for many years, but um, yeah, I, I just, I, you know, and I haven't written about it um since 2005 so it's been a long time and that was nonfiction. so uh, i just really felt a deep pull sort of a longing to to evoke in language again the landscapes of my childhood so, and to problematize them in terms of race and class uh, i think a, a lot of people know west virginia as the wild wonderful west virginia of travel brochures and whitewater rafting and greenbrier resort and skiing and so on um, but i wanted to write about it from the perspective of a character who grew up there poor um, and um, had you know uh, limited access to many of the recreational opportunities that people from outside west virginia know that landscape for Thank you, Joy. That's that's it's wonderful that your work can it can allow you to you know can go, can allow you to return to home. Um, Alan, I'm passing the the Zoom mic to you of, regarding landscape and such. 
Uh, how does it affect me? A lot. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to figure out, I guess. And my relationship, especially as I've lived in different places and um, just have a different relationship with the land now that I'm more in kind of an urban suburb as opposed to growing up really out in the middle of nowhere. Um, that's influencing the way I, I see a lot of areas and the way I see my past and, and see my childhood. It basically was in the same house other than college until I was about 25 and then lived in the Southwest for a couple of years and Louisiana for a couple of years. And I thought the Southwest was too flat then I moved to Louisiana and really experienced what's too flat. Um, so I, I couldn't wait to get back to the Northwest. And I just think about moving every couple of years somewhere else. But I just, I don't, I think I'd stop writing if that was the case. So it's just this eternal um, muse for me. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so Alan, uh, Christy, Christy Gledhill had a question for you as well in the chat. Um, Christy, are you available to ask this question? And if not, I, I would be happy to take it for you, but, oh, there you are. Take it away, Christy. Sure, I'm just curious about those postscript poems, Alan. I really, I loved your reading and um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know the whole story about those. So could you just enlighten us about how, where those came from and, and what, um, what inspired them? That's a that's a great question. Um, I'm still kind of thinking about that, but I think for me is I was studying a lot of letter poems, and then I know um, those for me started to morph into postcard poems to be a little more succinct and anecdotal, and then that started having some limitation. And so I thought about, well, what does the PS mean? And how does, how is that a sort a different style and a different content than what we do back when we used to write letters? Have you heard of those? And it's kind of two categories. It's either something that was like, oh yeah, this is why I was writing you in the first place and I forgot. And so I'm gonna add it at the end or this is something that has nothing to do with um, why I wrote you, but I really need to fit it in before I mail this off. So they, they give me a lot of more liberty to be um, associative and conflicting, I suppose, as far as especially there's a lot of, I don't know if it really, was illustrated today, but um, a lot of the absurd and the comical with the um, opposite of that and how there's that range, especially if you have you know, just one page, how are you gonna fit all this in without it seeming really disjointed? But we can, we can do that in some kinds of writing and Probably poems are one way to do that. Yeah, I like it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thanks for that wonderful question, Christy. And um, the, the, the beauty of these terrain.org readings is so, sometimes the folks asking the questions are like beautiful writers themselves, including, um, so you, you might want to check out three poems by Christy on, uh, on terrain.org. I'm going to just drop it in the chat. I'm going to steal Simmons Thunder for a second here. And just hit that hit that button and hit and put the link there. So, but Simmons was kind of like, "Hey, you remember those poems?" And 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 there they are. So, um, yeah. And we have some other questions coming in for for Joy. It looks like, um, yeah. Um, John Ballard, are you here? Let's go to you first, my friend. If you're here. There you are. Sorry about that. Hi, Joy. How are you doing? Um, 
Juan, I, I thought that you would, you would sound much better uh, putting this question out there than me, but I, I will I will take a jump at it. All right. Oh, you so <laughs> carry on. All right. Thank you. So uh, um, where's my question at? All right. So uh, Joy, clearly you've you've been working on uh, flight risk for a while, and uh, I am not a novelist, of course. I write poems, and so I was wondering. How do you know when a novel is at that point uh, when it's finished? Yeah, that's a really great question. Thanks, John. Um, you know, this is only my third novel, so I'm not a novel expert either. And all three of them had a really different process for me. Um, I guess, you know, I have the sense that it's finished when I've answered all the questions that it raised that I can answer. I mean, the ending may still raise more questions, new questions, and I think that that's fruitful. I think that's a, a really rich way for a novel to end. Um, but I, I do feel like for me, it's a bit of a contract with the reader that if if I, the author, am raising questions in the course of the novel, that I bring those to closure, at least aesthetic closure, if not closure at the level of meaning, right? I mean, because some of the problems we wrestle with are so big, we we don't we can't answer them. But when we bring them to an aesthetic closure, I think that's when I feel like, okay, no. I do feel like this is done. And then, of course, though, I send it to my agent and then the, the agent says, no, you're not done yet. And, you know, tells me what else to do. But but usually they're like, yes, this is done. Um, and then, you know, of course, the editor has has their own ideas. So that's a really good question. But for me, it like a feeling of closure, a feeling of closure. Do I feel like I've honored that contract that I'm not jerking the reader around? So. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop another poem by by one of our one of our great question askers on there as well. So you can check out check out that poem as well. And um, Leanna I, Leanna posted another question, and I'm gonna just kind of open it up to this. It, it, it is directed to Joy about um, kind of spanning genres and kind of playing a various genres. But I want to see if Eliz I'm gonna I want to open up to Elizabeth and Alan as well, like. Do, do you all write in multiple genres and what's what's kind of the wisdom that you would give us to kind of uh you know kind of jump around in genres elizabeth you unmuted so i'm gonna just oh. get out of the way uh well um you know i think i write sometimes uh lyric essays really short uh and i think uh that they uh aren't prose poems, so I'm not really exactly sure why. Uh, it's probably to do with the sentence structure and the, uh, the language, the cadence. Um, but, but mostly I write poems and um, I, um, I, I really love to play with the form and to figure out the structure inside the poem, uh, what it needs best for its exterior form. And so I move my lines around a lot and uh, poems take me a really long time for the most part. Uh, and so I, with all that time, uh, going back to something uh, to give myself some distance and to kind of be able to reflect to see what I was doing and then changing the lines again, figuring out a different form uh, for the poem. Um, I think it's, it's a process that I also encourage my students to, to do, especially now, it's so easy for us working on laptops and um, moving things around. So it's a real luxury that I enjoy. I, I find the revision process incredibly fun <laughs> and rewarding. So I hope that answers your question. Alan, what about you and in, 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 in genre jumping? What, how about you? No, not much. I started as a fiction writer, but I just fell in love with the line and I can't, I can't leave the line and those, the line breaks and all that it can do. So maybe someday it just feels so huge. Even a short story overwhelms me. So don't hold your breath, but thanks for asking. 
<laughs> well, the line can't quit you either, so that's all right. Joy, Joy, the question was originally for you. Um, how would how would you elaborate on on that on that on that choice as uh, as put in the question? Well, I guess I would I would echo what Elizabeth said about trying to pay attention to what it needs, um, the piece itself. Um, I I really listen a lot, you know, to to what the piece seems to want to be um, uh, and what its scope is, what its its intended scope is. So, you know, I write short fiction and novels. I write essays and book length nonfiction. And, and then also, you know, film criticism and literary criticism. I was trained as a scholar, not as a writer. But I did, I did write a little something about choosing between um, fiction and nonfiction, so I can drop that in the chat. It's in brevity, and I'll, I'll put it in the chat now for um, there. And it's about a genre as a vessel for presence. That's what it's called. You know, the, the genre is just the vessel. It's the presence that that really matters. Yeah, so. mm, that's great. And, and, and uh, wow. Yeah, and thanks for thanks for dropping that line, uh, dropping that that link to brevity. That's really great. Uh, fr friendly reminder that sometimes, because sometimes I get overwhelmed with the Zoom stuff. Um, if if you if you look in the bottom right corner on the three dots, if you click on there, you can hit save chat, and you can have access to all the wonderful links that have been shared today. If you're just kind of like I, I don't I don't you know, it, it might it might save you some time, and and it would also help you go shopping later for all the all the wonderful books that you might want to purchase and all the all the terrain.org um, prose and poetry that you want, you're going to get to read later on. So, um, yes, uh, thanks for those shares, Simmons. That's 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 extremely generous. Um, we we have time. Is there does, does anyone have a last? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ease this out. I'm gonna go like this because it's getting dark here, and I can hear my dogs walking down the street um, with with my partner and family. So. Um, Hopefully they don't interrupt. But anyway, no. Is, does anyone have any last questions for us that they want to kind of share with the? Or, or you can gush. There's still room to gush, to with our three authors. So, oh, okay. We got we got a last question for Elizabeth. It's regarding walking. What do you go for a walk with? Uh, right now, bear spray. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what do I go for a walk with? Like, um, uh, I just take myself, I guess. Um, I go, you know, I think it's, um, I walk, I usually walk in the same place almost every day. So I'm really familiar. Um, uh, you know, obviously with the with the landscape and the terrain. So I'm always interested to see what's going on and, and what's different or what's, you know, what's changed, uh, what's new. Uh, but recently uh, where I live um, and, and where I walk, uh, there's this area that was the Inland Sea. So I find these fossils regularly and uh, I've gotten really good at finding the fossils. Um, I just find, you know, like several every time I walk. And um, I think I'm going to get some um, uh, ge geology tools, and I don't know what they're called, but uh, and start to dig around and look for different kinds of fossils. I found like three, uh, everything that's in this area pretty much, but I, I think there, there could be more. So anyway, I think I'll start walking with these tools once I get them. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. All right. Um, Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to give the last word to, to our illustrious uh, and, and gracious leader here, Simmons. Simmons, do you have any last parting words for us before we do one round, more round of applause for our, our, our three readers? Uh, yeah, I want to thank um, you, Juan, for doing such a phenomenal job leading us <laughs> tonight. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate it. And of course, um, to Joy and Elizabeth and Alan, thanks so much um, for joining us. Yeah, let's give them all another round of applause whether it's out loud or uh, you know the snaps, as the case may be, really uh, phenomenal. It's so great to see everybody here um, on a Monday evening, and be sure to join us on the fourth Monday in October. Until then, uh, you know, have a uh, great week. <laughs>